Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Robert Henning. I'm the director here at the museum, and I'm so glad to see a nice crowd out tonight for our presentation on the Bozeman Trail. Before we get started, of course, lots of announcements. Uh, maybe a month ago, I said, we don't really have much going on in November. All of a sudden, <laughs> we've got a lot going on in November. So let me tell you about it. Uh, we've got a couple new traveling exhibits. Uh, the first one is called Wyoming Navy. It is from Fort Casper Museum, and it features ships named for Wyoming people and places. It does sound kind of funny, Wyoming Navy, right? But it's a very nice exhibit. A lot of research went into it. It is on the Roy Lowe Memorial exhibit wall in the museum annex building. So the building across the parking lot. So come and check that out. We will have an opening on uh, Veterans Day, November 11th. And we will um, have one of our volunteers, Pastor Bob Brown, who was a, is a retired Navy chaplain. will talk about the ships and then about his experience on the USS Detroit. Uh, and he went on uh, several, several journeys on the Detroit. So uh, that'll be great uh, for those of us that didn't serve in the Navy to learn about what life is like on a ship. That is um, obviously November 11th, 6.30 p.m. So come out for that. We will be open that day from 5.30 to 8.30. So feel free to come a little early and check out the exhibit. Uh, Wyoming Humanities has shared a pop-up exhibit with us called Two Nations, One Reservation, about, of course, the Wind River Reservation and the folks that call that reservation home. So that is in the Kintz Room all the way up in the front by the fireplace. So please check that out as well. We're excited to announce, we just got final confirmation today that we will be hosting a documentary called The Mustangs, America's Wild Horses uh, at Camplex Heritage Center Theater, November 20th at six o'clock p.m. 6 o'clock p.m. on November 20th. The mission will be free with a suggested donation to the Museum Association. This is a, an award-winning film that is just being screened around the country. This will be the first screening in Wyoming, so we're excited about that. Uh, Robert Redford, uh, Patty Schialfa Springsteen, and uh, Jessica Springsteen are producers, uh, featuring music from Bruce Springsteen, Willie Nelson, Emmylou Harris, and a new song by Diane Warren, performed by Blanco Brown. So come and see that again, November 20th at the Camplex Heritage Center Theater. Finally, we'll be open on Sunday, November 28th for Museum Store Sunday. Uh, we'll have some refreshments, come out and celebrate uh, the museum gift shop and check out the great products we have for sale. One to five on November 28th. So without further ado, our speaker tonight is Dave McKee. He is president of the Fort Phil Kearney Bozeman Trail Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation, development, education, and promotion of the Bozeman Trail and associated historic sites, including Fort Phil Kearney, Fetterman Battlefield, and Wagon Box Battlefield National Historic Landmarks. He currently serves as co-chairman of the Bozeman National Historic Trail Project. He's with us tonight to review the history of the Bozeman Trail and discuss the work being done to designate the Bozeman as a National Historic Trail. Please welcome Dave McKee. Well, thank you, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Finally made it here. Beautiful day for a drive, so it's great to be here. I thought what we would do this evening is just do a brief historic overview of the Bozeman Trail and related events. Um, I'm an archeologist by training, so I work for a whole bunch of historians who know a lot more than I do. But uh, we'll do a brief history of the trail and then talk about our effort to um, get the Bozeman Trail listed as a National Historic Trail. Um, I am presenting on this um, on behalf of our Fort Phil Kearney um, Bozeman Trail Association. And we're partnering with a nonprofit organization in Montana, Our Montana. Their mission is preservation, enhancement, and enjoyment of recreation opportunities, natural resources, and cultural resources in Montana. And of course, they've got quite a bit of the Bozeman Trail following along the Yellowstone over to Virginia City. So we're partnering together to see what we can get done.
we undertook this project because we think there's some real benefits to national designation. One, just as people who are interested in preserving history and culture, uh, we think that the Bozeman Trail is worthy of national designation. It really needs to be underscored and highlighted for current generations, but more importantly for future generations. Um, the trail and the associated sites, uh, this is really important in our local and regional history and this is something we need to pass on and really um, highlight for um, future generations. We think the national uh, designation would increase interest in visitation um, and revenue to our museums and our staffed historic sites. Um, if we can get increased uh, interest in visitation, um, we also think that designation will strengthen grant applications that you folks, folks like us put in for education projects, preservation projects. So strengthen our grant application process. And if we can do that, uh, we're very optimistic about expanding, increasing, and enhancing our education and preservation projects that we do. Um, so we think those are all benefits. And finally, if we can get increased interest in, and increased visitation to our museums and historic sites, we think there's a direct benef economic benefit to our local communities, particularly our rural communities in um, southern Montana and in Wyoming and the Powder River country. So we think those are the benefits and we thought it was worth trying to do. I think we'll start the historic overview on um, May 26th, 1863. A group of about six fortune seekers were headed to do some gold panning. They were turned back by a group of Cheyenne and they skedaddled down to Alder Gulch and decided to pan anyway and they struck gold. So, and they knew it was quite a rich deposit. So they decided to go to the nearest town and they said, we're gonna keep quiet. And then they just started spending their, their gold dust everywhere. Uh, particularly um, Bill Fairweather and, and his group. And so by the time they left the nearest post, there were 200 people following them back to Alder Gulch. So they turned around and they had a meeting. They said, okay, so, We'll start filing claims and us six, we get to file first and go from there. Well, within a span of about three years, um, the population along Alder Gulch turned into Virginia City, Montana, and a little bit to the north, Nevada City, and went from a population of six miners to a population of about 5,000 in Virginia City and about 10,000 in that, in that drainage. Um, Virginia City was temporarily the uh, Montana Territory capital. That was the first stage lines were established there, the first banks were established there. Um, so it was a typical mining boom town. And then in the space of about 10 years, things played out. And so by, I don't know, 1875, 1876, we're back down to a population of under a thousand, maybe a couple of hundred. So a very typical boom and bust. I just went there this summer for a dedication of a, a new interpretive sign on the Bozeman Trail and their current population is 190. Mm -hmm. but, the, uh, but the history of Virginia City and the boom time is alive and well there. Well, to the, of course, the main thing was how do we get to the gold? And so what's the best route? Well, Jim Bridger established a first trail to get from the Oregon Trail along the Platte River north. And he went west of the Bighorn Mountains, so up through the Bighorn Basin to the west. A um, couple problems with it. It was dry. There wasn't much forage, so it was a very harsh trip. But what Bridger pointed out is that it was relatively safe. He was pretty good friends with the Shoshone. And he said, this is the way I'd recommend we go. If we try to go up the east side of the Bighorns, we're going to run into a whole lot of folks who do not want us there. So he established the first trail. But it was harsh. And so people said, we really do need a shortcut, something, something with more water, more forage, and reduce the miles and the number of weeks and months it takes us to get to, to Virginia City. 
Enter John Bozeman. John Bozeman was born in Georgia and he actually had a wife and two children. And in 1862, he left his family to head for the gold fields in Colorado, never to see his family again. Um, got to Colorado, uh, didn't have any luck. And so he went up to Montana to the gold fields on Alder Gulch and around Bannock. And again, he had no luck. So what's he gonna do? So he struck up a partnership with a, um, a guide and a frontier man, John Jacobs, and they decided they could probably make more money guiding miners than being miners themselves. So um, in the spring of 1863, he and Jacobs and Jacobs' daughter came out on the Yellowstone and down the east side of the uh, Medicine Bow Mountains to identify a trail where they would guide prospective miners and uh, immigrants um, up to Montana. Um, just a post note on Bozeman. Um, this is one of historians debate for many years. He did pass away in 1867 um, in Montana. The story was that uh, he and another partner of his, Tom Glover, were headed out to secure a contract for uh, a mill with the military. And uh, his partner Cover came in and said, we were attacked by Pegan Indians. John was killed, I was wounded, got a bullet in my shoulder, and that's the, that's the story. Um, the famous cattleman Nelson Story sent one of his crack hands out to look at the site, and um, his scout said, I saw no sign of Indians. So this is one that uh, historians love to debate. <laughs> but uh, John uh, Bozeman had a short but colorful life. Anyway, uh, so they, they scouted out a trail. It's called the Bozeman Trail, but all they were doing were following well-established uh, American Indian trails that had been used for millennia. Um, and over here, coming down the east face, this could be part of what the Blackfeet called the Great North Trail. The Crow, and incidentally, it's a picture of some Crow folks. The Crow have a name for this old trail, and they call it, in their language, the trail that goes south. So Bozeman and Jacobs didn't exactly uh, blaze something new. They were following a pretty well-established route. But anyway, what it did is it got him, gave him a 535 mile shortcut between the Oregon Trail on the Platte River and the gold fields around Virginia City. So then between 1863, 1864 and 66, four trails that pretty much follow the same corridor were established. Um, Bozeman's Trail, should have brought a pointer. Mm -hmm. Starts a little bit uh, to the east of Casper at Deer Creek Station in what is now Glen Rock, Wyoming. And they left from Deer Creek Station in 63 with their first group of uh, their first wagon train. Uh, a year later, uh, the second route was established from Richards or Rashad's Bridge in Evansville, Wyoming, or Casper, and they went north and tied into Bozeman's route. And then in 65 and 66, the U.S. military from over at Fort Fetterman then started their routes and tied in. And they more or less follow the same corridor. As I mentioned, the first uh, expedition north on the trail was by uh, Bozeman and Jacobs in 1863 from Deer Creek Station in Glenrock. Um, this and its trading post had been there for a while. The Overland Mail and Pony Express Station was established and the US military had a garrison there. So they took off from Deer Creek Station that summer of 63 with a group. Oh, and if you go to Glen Rock today, I have a bias about Glen Rock, some people know. My wife's family has been training me in the history for a number of years. But if you go there, uh, there's a nice little monument to Deer Creek uh, Station right down on the grounds where it used to be, right off of uh, Second Street. Anyway, they headed north and they got to about Rock Creek area, just north of Buffalo, Wyoming, and ran into a contingent of Cheyenne and the Cheyenne told them in no uncertain terms that they needed to turn around and get out of Cheyenne country. 
most of the wagon train did turn around and go back. Um, Bozeman and about six other folks on their on horseback went ahead and scampered north and got to Virginia City. So the first expedition in 63 didn't go well. In 64, um, Bozeman and a couple of other guides gathered together a wag wagon trains to take north. So this is the current little park um, in Evansville, um, Rashaw's Bridge. So they left from there in 64 and um, Bozeman did make it to Virginia City. And as it turns out, that was his one and only guiding trip for a wagon train. And then he went into other pursuits. Um, but others did as well and, and followed his route and started going north. As promised, it was a shortcut better than Bridger's uh, Western Trail. Uh, plentiful water, plentiful forage for the oxen and the mules and the livestock. However, there was one shortfall to using this route, which Bridger had pointed out years before, which is that it was going to cut right through uh, ceded treaty territory of all the Plains tribes. Um, now by 63, 64, the Lakota, the Arapaho and the Cheyenne had moved west and north and it essentially pushed the Crow up onto the Yellowstone. So originally it was the area that um, the Bozeman Trail goes through was through Crow Indian territory, but by the time people started using the trail, it was the Lakota, it was the Cheyenne and the Arapaho who were controlling the area. In response, the army and they started attacking the wagon trains to try and expel what they felt like were the intruders. And it was their prime bison hunting ground. Um, it was the heart of their country. So I can understand their reaction. Um, so the response of the U.S. Army, the Division of the Platte, said, well, we're going to send soldiers out here. We're going to build two new forts. Reno had already been established, but I don't think Reno was very big or extensively built at that time. So they were going to resupply Reno and they were going to build uh, what turned out to be Fort Phil Kearney and Fort C.F. Smith. So three forts and protect the travelers was the idea. Here's a artist rendition of Reno. The um, military forces will, were led by um, Colonel uh, Henry B.B. Carrington, and he had elements of the 18th Infantry and 2nd Cavalry with him. So they stopped at Reno first to, to restock that one, and then they kept heading north, and in July of 66, uh, he found a spot on Piney Creek that he really liked and he said, we're gonna build the fort here. And it turns out it was gonna be named Fort Phil Kearney. Um, there were some nice advantages about it. It was kind of on flat high ground. So you could see down to the creeks and have a pretty good view there. And also to the south and east is a high point called Pilot's Knob, if you've ever been there to the fort. And you could put, um, guards up there with signal flags and they could see for a long ways and they could signal you about what was going on. So that was all pretty good. Um, the one downfall as we're going to see in a little bit is that it was quite a ways from the forest. So you're at the foothills of the Bighorn, but it's a ways to get wood and wood is critical. So that was, that was the weakness of this. And then finally, uh, Fort C.F. Smith was constructed just across the state line in Montana and, and um, staffed there. So you've got the three forts, <clears throat> which precipitated an interesting thing. The tribes had already been fighting with the immigrants a number of battles, minor skirmishes, some casualties, sometimes just theft of livestock, but a range of interactions. And an interesting thing, the Plains tribes, uh, for on a rare occasion, formed an alliance. 
and started to plan together, which was pretty unusual. And at the time, one of the political leaders and a warrior of great reputation was Red Cloud. So they formed an alliance and they actually did some strategic planning about how to get after the army. And historians popularly call it Red Cloud's War. Um, although there were some other prominent chiefs who were really the masterminds behind the actual conflicts. But Red Cloud was definitely a leader in getting everybody together. And that resulted in three major fights, the Fetterman battle, the Hayfield fight, and the Wagon Box fight, three major encounters. And um, during that period between 63 and 68, um, BLM archaeologist Buck Damone's doing some pretty good research. And so far, he's got good documentation for 160 other encounters between either the soldiers in the tribes or the wagon trains in the tribes. Again, some minor skirmishes, sometimes with casualties. So, and, and most of all of these 160 uh, documented engagements happen here in Wyoming. So, it was a dangerous trail to, to be traveling on. Red Cloud's alliance included the seven council fires of the Lakota, Red Cloud, of course, American Horse. Really, one of the influential um, leaders was High Backbone, a mini Kanju chief and a young up and coming warrior named Crazy Horse. Northern Cheyenne were led by Dull Knife, Little Wolf, and Little Wolf's Crazy Dog Society. The Northern Arapaho, uh, some of their prominent leaders, Black Coal, Eagle, and Little Chief. Again, pretty rare occasion for people to coalesce, um, form an alliance, and plan some actions together. Okay, some of the prime characters. This is Colonel Henry B.B. Carrington. Um, he was practicing law in Ohio when the Civil War broke out. He was commissioned to um, into the Union Army, and his main job was to recruit volunteers, supply them, and transport them to the Civil War. And he recruited over 200,000 um, volunteers. Um, he was uh, then mustered out at the end of the Civil War, but came back in and they put him in command of um, the 18th Infantry, portions of the 2nd Cavalry and said, you're going to Wyoming and you're gonna build forts and you're gonna protect the Bozeman Trail. Um, this was not a popular commission among the junior officers. The junior officers, many of them were decorated Civil War veterans and Colonel Carrington, although he had a productive time, he did not see action in battle. So his junior officers were pretty critical of him. A couple of really interesting people, um, his wife, Margaret Carrington, uh, she came from a very prominent family, originally in Kentucky, but her grandfather founded what became the town of Columbus, Ohio and her father founded what became Ohio State University. Um, anyway, she came west, and um, when they were at Fort Kearney in Nebraska, they met with um, Tecumseh Sherman, who was in charge of the Platte District out of Omaha, but he met him at Fort Kearney, and he told, said, yes, the family should go with the officers. This is gonna be fine. And he recommended to them that they should, that the wives should keep diaries. And Margaret Carrington did, and it's really detailed. And she really had an eye for the flora, the fauna, uh, comments on the tribes. She really loved Jim Bridger and she writes about Jim Bridger who worked as a scout for Carrington. Um, and so if you wanted to get a historic sort of in, at that time picture of what it was like, um, I recommend reading her uh, book, Land of the Crows. Um, it, it's, she really had an eye for detail. So they went, the families went, and Margaret uh, took notes. Second interesting person, I also recommend reading My Army Life by Frances Grumman Carrington. Um, Frances Grumman was the wife of George Washington Grumman, uh, who was lieutenant with the Second Cavalry at Fort Phil Kearney. And they arrived at Fort Phil Kearney, Mr. and Mrs. Grumman, um, in 
September of 66. So a couple of months after they'd started constructing the fort and, and had the stockade up. And she also kept a diary. Um, and as we'll see here in a bit, um, her husband charged over Lodge Trail Ridge with Fetterman and didn't come back. So um, in January of 67, um, the Carringtons, Colonel Carrington had been reassigned and she took the body of her husband and went with the Carringtons and went south in January. And then she went back to Tennessee where she was from. She applied for Georgia's military pension and was um, shocked to learn that uh, he was a polygamist and uh, he had another wife. <laughs> but uh, she finally got the pension. And um, as you'll know from her name, there's more to the story. So in um, 1870, Marie uh, Carrington passed away. She sent a note of condolence to, to Henry. Of course, they'd been at the fort together. They started to correspond and she married uh, Henry uh, Carrington. And so they were together for a while and Carrington adopted her son um, that she eventually bore. Um, and she wrote a book, My Army Life. And for historians who are really interested in the um, uh, Colonel Carrington and Francis Grumman and Fetterman's um, disagreements and headbutting and who said what on December 21st. Um, there's several editions of My Army Life and you can see Henry Carrington editing every edition that she puts out. Um, and he did spend a lifetime trying to clear his name, but um, a lot of times we overlook the women on this uh, center stage of these events. And I, I, would, I would recommend reading their two works. Captain William Judd Fetterman, um, captain of elements of the 18th. He came to Fort Phil Kearney. He was one of the people critical of Colonel Carrington. He was a decorated Civil War veteran, heavy action in the Atlanta campaign, other places decorated in the field, known as bold and rash and impatient, but heroic. So some strengths and some weaknesses. Um, he and his uh, cohort, Lieutenant George Washington Grumman, when Grumman got there, were very critical of um, Carrington and they wanted to mount and they wanted to go out in the winter and they wanted to attack the Plains Indian villages because the Lakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho, I mean, basically they were from the Montana border, big camp down where Sheridan is right now in Goose Creek. So they wanted to take the initiative and Carrington said, we don't have sufficient arms. I've asked for more rounds of ammunition. We don't have the firepower to go take that risk. And so he was very cautious. Um, there is an anecdotal story about uh, Fetterman that historians debate. And that one night he was in the Sutler store inside Fort Phil Kearney. And he said with 80 men, I can ride through the Indian nation and I can take them out. And there was a laugh from the back of the room and everybody looked back there and, and Jim Bridger was sitting back there and he said, you may know the Civil War, but you don't know anything about fighting Indians <laughs> and just laughed. Anecdotal story, some people say it happened, some say it did not. His buddy was Lieutenant George Washington Grumman with the 2nd Cavalry, as I say, the Grumman's showed up in September of 66. Uh, he was also heavily decorated in the Civil War for his valor and heroism. He also took a lot of risks. He was court-martialed for treating his enlisted men poorly and beating up a couple of them. Um, so a mix for him. And um, most people say, yes, he had a bit of a problem with the bottle, but brave, and risky. So that kind of sets the stage for uh, the first major battle, the Fetterman battle. This is looking out from our current stockade at Lodge Trail Ridge. The tribes had been harassing the wood trains. I mentioned that the wood was quite a ways from the fort. So they would have the woodcutters out in camp and then they would 
uh, take the wagon boxes off of the wagon wheel gear and put the logs on and roll them back to the fort. Um, and the tribes would swoop in and start to attack. And so Carrington would send forces out to relieve the wood train and scatter the Indians. And his primary order that he kept giving was, whatever you do, don't go over Lodge Trail Ridge. Um, on December 6th of 66, they attacked the wood train and some decoys came out and tried to entice uh, Fetterman uh, and Grumman in particular into going over Lodge Trail Ridge. They didn't take the bait, but they got separated and it was a narrow escape for the military forces that went out to relieve the wood train. They almost got encircled and it almost went bad for them, but they got out of it. Um, on December 21st, 66, wood train was attacked and Fetterman and Grumman came, uh, Fetterman and uh, Grumman came up to Carrington and said, we want to lead the forces out. We want to go relieve the wood train. And again, here's a, a point of historic debate. There were witnesses that said they stood right there and listened to them. And Carrington said, yes, but whatever you do, don't go over Lodge Trail Ridge, whatever you do. And so off they went to relieve the wood train. And what ensued is what some people call the Fetterman Massacre, the Fetterman Battle. The tribes had come down from the Sheridan area about the night before and had a big meeting and a planning meeting. And when they were meeting, there was a medicine man named Crazy Mule. And he went out in front of everybody and he walked out and he walked out and he came back and he said, I have a handful of soldiers. And you've probably heard this story. And the chief said, that's not enough. So he, Crazy Mule went back out and he said, uh, and he came back and he said, I have two handfuls of soldiers. And the tribal forces said, that's ah, not enough. So he went out a third time and had a vision, came back and he said, I have a hundred soldiers in my hand. So for the tribes, the name of this encounter is the battle of the hundred in the hand. That's where that comes from. And they decided what they would do is their normal strategy. They would attack the wood train and then they would set out decoys to try and entice the relieving military force to come over Lodge Trail Ridge. And for this, this one, they selected six young um, up and coming warriors. So for the Northern Arapaho, Black Coal and Eagle, and for the Northern Cheyenne, um, Left Wolfhand and a Big Nose. And then for the Lakota, Sword, American Horse, and a young up and coming warrior that they were all pretty impressed with named Crazy Horse. So Crazy Horse was the leader. So they go over the ridge and they taunt the soldiers and Fetterman and Grumman start to come after them. And then they hesitate. And then there's various stories about what Crazy Horse actually said, but he got them to come. And so they chased the six decoys over the ridge and one oral history is that when they got to the top and Fetterman sort of hesitated um crazy horse got off his horse and was looking at his horse's foot like his horse had gone lame and there were some shots being fired around him and they came on after him then and so he jumps back on his horse and they go across lodge trail ridge here are some of the participants um, we've shown you some of the military actors, um, of course, American Horse, who during the battle in the next 45 minutes uh, personally takes Fetterman out. Uh, Little Wolf and Dull Knife for the Northern Cheyenne. One of the interesting things about the battle is it was pretty complex and they were, they were hiding and they were going to ambush and they were waiting for a signal from the decoys when it was time to spring the trap. And as you know from history, so many times the trap would be set, but for warfare, it's like personal honor and somebody would go quick, too quick. Somebody would go too early. The, um, in this particular battle, discipline was being maintained by the Crazy Dog Society for the Northern Cheyenne and by the Braveheart Society from the Lakota. Um, so they were really trying to pull this off. 
But anyway, Little Wolf and Lone Life, Black Coal from the Northern Arapaho is a primary participant in the battle, as well as Little Chief from the Northern Arapaho. <clears throat> this is just kind of a quick map in red, the Bozeman Trail. You can see Fort Phil Kearney right down here. So for the Fetterman battle, they crossed Lodge Trail Ridge. And basically when you go on to what it was then known as High Backbone Ridge, now it's called Fetterman Ridge, um, you're basically following the Bozeman Trail. And there's some intact ruts here in the battlefield. Um, and then a year later, we'll just show, talk about in a minute, the wagon box fight. So Fort, Fort Phil Kearney, and they chase the uh, decoys over Lodge Trail Ridge, and then out on the high backbone ridge. So we're standing on high backbone ridge, and we're looking back at what now is the monument for the Fetterman battle. And you're looking at Lodge Trail Ridge, so the forks on the other side. So the decoys got them to come over. 18th Infantry kind of came through here, through this saddle. The cavalry came across here. And some of the cavalry split and came down over here and actually rode right through uh, Cheyenne and so many Kanju hiding in ambush. Rode right through them and didn't see them and just kept going. And so they enticed the cavalry and the infantry to keep coming out on high backbone ridge toward us, toward our view. And one of the valiant acts was the uh, decoy big nose for the Northern Cheyenne. And if they started to slow down, he would parade back and forth in front of him on his horse and basically say, come get me. So they kept following him. Went out on the ridge, the cavalry came out in front, broke out, and went down into the valley. And the infantry got extended out here on the ridge. And once they were in that position, the decoy said, when, when that happens, we're going to be riding down in the valley and we're going to crisscross each other. And that's the signal to sprint, spring the trap. So on the far side down below the ridge, uh, the Oglala is a lot of mini kanju. Lakota, uh, Northern Cheyenne over here, Oglala, Lakota out in front down in the valley. So they spring the trap, they push the cavalry back up, and they start retreating up the hill with the infantry, pretty heavy casualties, and the warriors coming up from both sides. And actually the warriors had, and it's the number's not known, but quite a few um, um, fatalities and injuries from friendly fire because they were shooting from both sides to the top of the ridge. Anyway, at the end, um, there were a few of the cavalry and some of the cavalry and the infantry made it back to a group of rocks about where the monument is, and that was the last group. So from crossing Lodge Trail Ridge, going down, and then the initiation of the fight, it took about 45 minutes for them to wipe everybody out. Um, soldiers had a real problem. Um, as mentioned before, Carrington couldn't get new armaments and he couldn't get enough rounds, so they hadn't done target practice. And they were using Springfield muzzle loading rifles. The cavalry actually had some carbines, and the funny thing about that was they didn't come with them. The band showed up at the fort and the band all had carbines. And so, <laughs> so the cavalry, Grumman and company said, we're taking the carbines. But it didn't, it didn't help them today. So about 45 minutes, they sent uh, Captain Ten Ake and with the relief column about a quarter after one in the afternoon. And by the time he got there, it was, it was over and they completely wiped them out. Well, this was terrible news, and Carrington said, I need somebody 
to ride to Horse Creek Telegraph Station and get the news on the telegraph to Sherman and the rest of the military, this is terrible. So John Portuguese Phillips stepped up and said he would volunteer to ride to Horse Creek Station down by Fort Laramie. Uh, Portuguese Philip was born in the Azores. When he was 16, he hopped on a whaling ship and made it to California where he became a gold miner. And then he went to Montana and he finally ended up at Fort Phil Kearney and was working as a civilian contractor transporting water for the army. But he said he'd go and he got to take Carrington's uh, thoroughbred horse and Dixon went with him and they left the night of the 21st in a snowstorm. They got to Fort Reno on the 23rd, maybe the morning of the 23rd, midday, I can't remember. And then they went on to Horse Creek. They rode a lot at night and they hid, but they made it. Um, and they got to Horse Creek Station. And uh, so they telegraphed out the news of the Fetterman battle and the loss. And when they had stopped at Reno, uh, Phillips had been given additional dispatches to get to Fort Laramie. So they got to Horse Creek Station at 10 in the morning on Christmas Day, the 25th. And then he headed to Fort Laramie and he got there at midnight. And it so happened that at the fort, they were having a full blown dress Christmas ball. And so the sentries brought him in and he banged in the door and he was covered with a buffalo robe and he was all frostbitten and gloves and stuff. It was this in the middle of this dress ball and gave him the news. Um, a lot of people said he rode by himself, but Dixon was with him and a couple other people rode at least part of the way with him. So it was a small group, but nasty weather and they made it. Um, after this whole incident at the fort, uh, Phillips um, moved down to um, Elk Mountain, north of Saratoga, and he started a tie hat camp. Um, and then later on after that, he uh, moved to an area and set up a trading post in a ranch south of KC. That was his uh, moment in history was the ride to Horse Creek Telegraph Station. So that was a big blow to the army. And then seven months later, two more major conflicts, uh, both coordinated by the tribes. Again, pretty, pretty interesting. The first was near Fort C.F. Smith in Montana, the Hayfield fight on August 1st. Uh, the tribes attacked a hang crew. Uh, outside a little ways from the fort. 23 soldiers and 12 civilians were surrounded, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Arapaho, mostly Cheyenne in this attack. Um, and after a day of fighting, three soldiers killed and five wounded uh, before relief was sent, and then the tribes dispersed. So, yeah, too small. The little CF Smith and then the corral that they made and fought. And if you go up there today, it's um, on Crowland but there's a monument there and that's about it for C.F. Smith. The day, very next day after that, and again, this was coordinated and planned, the Lakota came after the wood crews again, outside of uh, Fort Phil Kearney. And they call it the wagon box fight because they had taken the wagon boxes off the wagon so that they could load the logs and so they had a corral made out of the wagon boxes, and this is what the soldiers hid behind. Um, this is part of the Fort Phil Kearney complex that we're associated with, state manages it. Um, both the Fetterman battlefield, the fort and uh, wagon box, and state has most of it. Our association actually several years ago purchased and we own quite a bit of the wagon box battlefield to the west. So for the wagon box fight, they attacked the wood camp, uh, crazy horse in command of the attack on the wood camp. And the, their forces come down and consolidate here, and then they take a charge at the wagon box. The difference here was the infantry had just been um, given new Allen breech loading Springfields, Allen modified breech loading Springfield. So when the tribes charged in, they fired their first round 
And it was like, now we got him because they're going to have to reload. And then the second shot comes. And then a third shot comes. And so this really startled the tribes. And if not for the new Springfields, they probably could have just overrun them pretty quick. <clears throat> but anyway, it ended up in four, at least four main different attacks on the corral. Um, and then fine, and the casualties were pretty heavy on the tribal side. So after their attempts and about one in the afternoon when the relief column came, um, the leaders of the tribal forces said, that's enough, we're leaving. There's the monument today. So after three years of fierce fighting with the uh, military and numerous bouts with immigrants on the trail, um, the U.S. government says, let's meet in Fort Laramie and let's go ahead and do a new treaty. So the Laramie Treaty of 68, and as part of the agreement, the U.S. government said we will uh, withdraw from use of the Bozeman Trail and we will abandon the forts. So um, historically, this is one of those rare occasions in the short term where the tribes won, where Red Cloud's coalition won and uh, moved them out. Red Cloud himself lived to 1906. He did not come in for the initial uh, Laramie Treaty signing. Um, he was skeptical and he wanted to see the forts abandoned before he would come in. Um, he then eventually came in in the fall of 68 and signed the treaty. And when he signed the treaty, he never again once took up arms against the U.S. government. So he said, I'm going to give my word. And he did. Um, and then, of course, he went up to Pine Ridge Agency, um, buried up there above the mission school today. But uh, he pulled off a coalition that's rare in history on the plains. So pretty interesting. Um, he did come in and sign, but there were many who did not come in and sign the Laramie Treaty. Um, High Backbone, his son Hump, Crazy Horse, Little Wolf, uh, Dull Knife, um, Black Coal from the Northern Arapaho. So some of the major leaders who had been leading the fighting, they never came in and signed. So, as, and then as you know, there's another 10 years of, of conflict. In 1908, the town of Sheridan decided to have a uh, reunion and dedication of the Fetterman Battle Monument in 1908. And um, six of those folks are members of the 18th Infantry who were at Fort Phil Kearney. They obviously were not, didn't go over Lodge Trail Ridge that day. <laughs> and then in the middle, waving his hat is Colonel Carrington. And Francis Grumman Carrington, his second wife, standing next to him. And there's the monument today. And I have to tell a little short story. A number of years ago, before I was involved with the original uh, Bozeman Trail Association, they would do tours. And one of the tour guides, in addition to Bob Wilson, some of you guys may know Bob. Uh, he's the expert. Um, and um, Bill Taubel from the Northern Cheyenne would come down and do the tours with him. Um, Bill was a direct descendant of Blue Feather, who was one of the Ch Northern Cheyenne chiefs who was in the Fetterman battle. But I got to tell this, so they're standing there looking at the plaque, and Bill Taubel says, well, they got the plaque wrong. And everybody goes, what do you mean they got it wrong? And he says, well, read the bottom line. And it says, and there were no survivors. Well, I'm standing here. <laughs> so there's always there's always time to improve the accuracy or the perspective of history, but Bill kind of hit it on the nose. I can't pass it up. Um, so today, as you drive north from the Platte River, uh, Deer Creek Station, if you go up out of Fetterman or out of um, Glen Rock and get on the Ross Road and you're driving north, um, towards KC, you can see off to your left and right, 
some of the remnants of the old Bozeman Trail. So there are some intact ruts out there, and there's plenty of various parts of the Ross Road, parts of the Six Mile Road um, out of Buffalo, where if you got your GPS on and you're driving, it says well, you're on the trail. But off to the sides, you can see remnants of the wagon ruts. And um, and uh, there's there's some pretty accurate maps out there of the of the entire route. Um, there's certainly markers out there. The state of Wyoming in 1914 put in these large monolithic monuments at different points along the Bozeman Trail and interpretive signs. Uh, I think that one's on 287. And then at some of the sites, there's a little bit of interpretation and little pullouts. This is the Crazy Woman Crossing. There was a battle there um, in 66 in the spring. Um, some casualties, pretty fierce fighting, cavalry, a wagon train, and the uh, tribes. A couple of uh, infantry fatalities in that engagement. Uh, Fort Reno, there's a little pull out there. But there's not much, not much left as we were, we were talking, the monument and a little bit of interpretive signing for Fort Reno. And then, of course, where our little outfit's based out of Fort Phil Kearney, um, run by the state, and we support them. And if you haven't been there, we have uh, a building with interpretation and a bookstore. Our association runs the bookstore to provide funding for the state for operations and for some of our projects. I did want to mention uh, the state just received a uh, fairly large grant at Helmsley Foundation grant, and we're going to be expanding the interpretive area and expanding the bookstore. So we're going to add square footage and new interpretation. So we're actually pretty excited about that. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with why this, why we're interested, National Historic Trail designation. So what we're doing is we're following the steps in the National Trails Act of 1968. And there's two key steps, and they're both legislative. The first is to get our U.S. Congress to pass legislation, which directs the Secretary of Interior to do a feasibility study. So that's step number one, and that's where we're at. We're asking our congressional delegation, Wyoming and Montana, for the feasibility study. If the end of the feasibility study, they say, yes, it's worthy, and yes, it meets the criteria, then we go back to Congress and we ask for the second piece of legislation, which is the formal listing as a National Historic Trail. Here's our objectives for this whole thing. And there's people who are concerned about these kinds of things these days. <clears throat> we do not want any land acquisition, sometimes for national designation of a scenic trail or even a National Historic Trail, you might look for funds to purchase. We don't want any land purchase. Um, no federal overreach on private or state lands. And I'll get to some specific language on that in a minute. What our real ambition is as a nonprofit interested in preserving and promoting history is we want to direct visitors to the Bozeman Trail along the interstate corridor to our museums and to our staffed historic sites and to our communities. Uh, I don't think I want to send people from quite a ways away up the Ross Road. There's no gas stations, there's no food. So this is about um, keeping people on the interstate corridor to visit our museums where they can learn about the history. And uh, one thing we're following right very closely right now is there's a group in Kansas who are in the middle of this with the Chisholm Trail. They've already completed the feasibility study and they have a bill on the floor of the Senate for the national listing of the Chisholm Trail. And uh, I'm born and raised in Kansas and the Chisholm Trail is all on private land and it's ranch land and people are concerned about federal overreach. So the legislation they have on the floor has even additional language about private land protection. 
And I'm going to mention that because it's an issue for folks out here. Um, small world thing. They said you need to call, you need to call the guy in Kansas that's running this. Uh, his name's Ron Wilson. So I send this Ron Wilson an email. I didn't even stop to think about it. I get an email back, and he went, Dave McKee, Manhattan High School, class of '73. <laughs> <laughs> I went back this fall, and we met, and yeah, we're classmates. So how funny is that? Two oddballs who are both working on an astral trail thing. Uh, so, so we're following it. And in fact, we got an email this afternoon about two o'clock that uh, Interior's uh, and the subcommittee in the Senate is doing hearings on this. So it's on the floor. They're doing hearings and they're getting close. I mentioned the Bozeman Trail corridor, probably a little too busy, but this is our concept. This is our idea. We want people to be interested in the Bozeman Trail and we want them to, as they're traveling on their summer vacations with their families, we want them to stop at the Rock Pile Museum in Gillette and all along in Montana and Wyoming. Okay, the feasibility study. First thing, and it's the Secretary of Interior that does it, and the Secretary sets up a team of experts and they do the analysis and they do research. And of course, we're standing right there along with our Montana going, here's some historic information and here's some maps. And so we're standing by to give them information. They will identify a continuous route. But it does not have to be intact. What they're gonna do is look at historic maps, journals, documents, and say, yes, this is the route, the corridor. But there's gonna be parts that are already uh, due to development or the county roads on top of it, uh, it's okay. What they're looking for is the continuous route. Uh, it has to be nas of national significance, historic significance. Um, in 2002, the National Park Service, Denver office, and the Western History Association did a study of about eight historic trails in the West and applied criteria to them. And they said that the Bozeman Trail is nationally significant. Um, and it's because of the Red Cloud War. It's about the interaction between the military and Red Cloud and High Backbone. So the Park Service Interior has already said it's nationally significant. So we have that in our pocket. Um, they're also gonna look at the corridor and they're gonna identify through interviews and they will have public meetings and they will have a formal comment period. So if we can get to the feasibility study, there's gonna be opportunity for our communities to, to sit and talk to them. And they will identify recreate current and future recreation and education opportunities. So just looking at the map of the museums along our corridor, well, we've got the education opportunities in place and recreation opportunities, I think as well. And then they also look at what's going to be uh, potential economic benefits if we increase interest and we and we estimate how much of an increase we're going to get. What's what's going to be some dollar benefits? So they're going to look at that too. So we've been doing public outreach for about a year um, before going to Congress and saying, "Would you please?" past legislation. Um, we had three goals. We wanted to ensure that people, our neighbors knew what we were doing. Um, we wanted to have an opportunity to explain the national trail designation process, try to answer questions. If we couldn't answer it, get an answer. Um, and seek support for the legislation. So we're asking for people to write letters or contact their elected officials so we can um, get support for the legislation. Um, we've been really after it. So we made personal contacts by phone, by email, by face-to-face -face visits. We've done um, news releases, and then we got follow-up news articles, uh, Billings, Bozeman, Casper, Sheridan, papers. It's a way to get the word out. Um, if you go to our website, we've got a whole section dedicated to this uh, national trail effort. We've set up a unique 
project email. So if you just want to email us to send support or ask questions, um, we've got an email and I've got it in the, in the next couple slides. We put together a briefing paper for elected officials and we have a question and answer document where we pose questions about the national trail designation and then answer them. Uh, we did about a short six page historic overview <laughs> and uh, we've been making presentations. And this past summer, I focused on um, visiting tribal historic preservation officers to visit the fort and, and talk about it. The Crow have a lot of mileage of the Bozeman Trail on them. Um, so they're important. And of course, the Northern Cheyenne, the Northern Arapaho, and all the Lakota, their ancestors were right in the middle of this. So um, trying to engage them in, in partnering with us. And I would really like if we could get a feasibility study for the tribes to sit down with the feasibility team and tell their story, rather than me thinking I would tell their story for them. Um, so that's that's the pitch. Uh, we started with our U.S. congressional delegation, so we called the staffers, let them know what we were up to, sent them our information, and we called the governor's staff, Governor Gordon's staff, and we said, we're getting ready to do this. Here's our information. We're going to be contacting your constituents. So here's what we're about. Uh, we, can, we contacted the state legislators from the counties the Bozeman Trail passes through to let them know as well. And then county commissioners. So in Wyoming, five counties, five county commissions, and in Montana, eight. Um, so we've contacted actually county commissioners three different times um, and the tribes. Um, we hit industry as well. So we've talked to state and county travel and tourism associations. The state travel and tourism have submitted a letter of support. And I think of the couple of the counties that have Converse has. Um, Wyoming Stock Growers, Petroleum and Mining Associations, and the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. So I've either Zoomed or had meetings with them to explain what we're up to. And then organizations. So obviously, actually, the very first meeting we had was with the BLM Casper and, and um, Buffalo Field Offices. They've got a lot of the trail on them. And in short, the question was, if we get national designation, does that change your resource management plans? And they said, no. They've already got protections in place for the Bozeman Trail. And Wyoming State Archaeologists, Tribal Start Preservation Officers, uh, Wyoming Historical Society, trail associations, museums, et cetera. The biggest one was landowners. Um, so for, we sent out 225 letters to landowners who, when we looked at the map of the Bozeman Trail, and they had 160 or more acres, big landowners, uh, we sent them a letter. We did that for Converse, Campbell, Johnson, and Sheridan counties. We could not interface with Natrona County's GIS database. The other four we could, and we can pull the addresses. I don't know what it is with Natrona, but there aren't a lot of landowners in Natrona. So really the big ones are Johnson and Sheridan counties. Those are the big ones. And federal overreach on private land is a real significant and valid concern for people. So what we point to is the language in the National Trails Act. Section three, only those selected lands on federally owned lands in which meet the National Historic Trails criteria are included as federally protected components of a National Historic Trail. And then section five kind of addresses purchase of land. Um, only purchase a land with the consent of a private landowner. If a private landowner wanted, had Bozeman Trail and in, uh, intact segments and thought it was cool, they could put it in an easement if they wanted to. They could offer to sell it. I said in the beginning, our association does not want land purchase. We don't want to interfere with private land. So that's my response to, um, to folks with that concern. I read the language and I think we're in a good place. How can you help? Um, letters of support to our congressional delegation, 
And there is our email for this specific project, bozemannht at gmail.com. CC to Governor Gordon's office and spread the word on what we're doing. I'm glad to ask, answer questions. For more information, go to our Fort Phil Kearney Bozeman Trail Association website. We got some pretty cool historic articles about the Bozeman Trail and sites there. We got a whole section dedicated to the National Historic Trail Project. Um, a lot of information about our association, things we do. Um, and also under the National Trail Project, we've uh, set up some sample support letters if somebody wanted to write one and just wanted to have something to start with. Um, and we have the congressional mailing addresses for both the Montana and the Wyoming uh, U.S. Congre congressional delegation. And if you want to contact us with a comment or a question or would like to have a program, um, Bozeman NHT. And uh, we'll get back to you. With that, the journey continues, and thank you for your patience and letting me run a little long, probably. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. How many stage stops were along the trail? Do you have any idea? I do not. That's a good question. I do not. Well, obviously, they weren't going to make it in a timely fashion when it took four or five days to horseback from Sheridan down to Glen Rock, and you put wagons in the context, you're two weeks or better. And how many families came? Was it mostly families or individuals, or do you have any idea? You know, Susan Badger Doyle has written a book to the land of gold, which is kind of the, and she reproduced all the diaries that were written, and she has some pretty good in, um, estimates. I don't have them off the top of my head other than more single males, but there were families. And some of the diaries in Susan Badger Doyle's book um, are from those families, from the kids and wives and, and some of the men. And she's the one who produced a really accurate map of the Bozeman Trail. Now she's showing it as a single line. And as you well know, um, wagons didn't necessarily follow one, you know, so you spread out and then the next year or the place might be real muddy. So you go this way or, but, um, she's got the corridor pretty well mapped out. Yes, ma'am. What was, you mentioned two books and the authors I couldn't write fast enough. What was the other one? Um, Francis Grumman. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, let me, I'll go back and give you the exact title if I can get out of here. Let's go up here. My Army Life. Yeah, Francis Grumman Carrington, My Army Life. First published in 1910, but there's subsequent editions, and we sell it at our bookstore at Fort Phil Corning. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, did you get margaret carrington's book uh, my army's life. yeah my army life by francis grumman carrington and absaraka land of the crows by margaret carrington okay. we also sell in our bookstore <laughs> what kind of hours are you guys open there open from may till october 1st seven days a week and then we're closed during the winter um so we'll have to hibernate till may <laughs> not me i thought if maybe i maybe the library has some some of these yeah oh uh, people can can uh, email them and we can send them via online ah yeah Yes, sir. Several years ago at your big celebration up at Fort Kearney, you had a bus trip that went from KC all the way up north following the Bozeman Trail. Mm -hmm. I would like to, are you, any plans on doing that again? That We had our board meeting last night and we knew have, have a new interpretive ranger and that topic came up to be determined and we, we thought back about that. 
before I got involved with them, but I've seen the photos and heard people talk about it and was really well received. I made that trip. Ah. And it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. a, a really eye opening trip of, you know, Pumpkin Dukes and Fort Reno and all of the yeah. battles and stuff that were fought all the way up. Was it Ranchester was the last one? Yeah, the Connor. Yeah. Yeah, the and Connor battle. It, it was a, a phenomenal day. It was well done. Mm -hmm. And stopped at KC to the museum there and the museum in Buffalo. And they, they did a phenomenal job. I just wanted to compliment your association for putting that on and recommend you do it again because it was well, well worth it for the history of the area. Good deal. Yeah, it's. We talked about it last night about reviving that. And then they used to do a, a um, Bozeman Trail Days at the fort. And uh, we're thinking now that the state's staffed up, we're thinking about doing reviving that, or but maybe calling it Fort Kearney Days and having some events. The other two things we're working on is with Sheridan College Music Department, uh, we're gonna host a concert at the fort and they're gonna play the military music of the period. In other words, what the band at Fort Phil Kearney was playing. So they, they found the music and we're going to do a historic music concert. Um, no jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep working on it. Uh, and, uh, and the other one that we're working on is a partnership with the Sheridan Sportsman Club and Sheridan Land Trust. And we're going to put on an event um, on historic firearms. And we're now um, putting together, starting to put together an agenda of presenters. So the Fort Kearney regulars will probably be part of that, our, our guys who do the living history and, um, and other people who are interested in historic firearms. So we're going to do a whole day of that. And we have another program on Northern Arapaho language. We've got a scholar on Arapaho language and a couple of elders coming and we're going to do a symposium on language. And so we've got a couple other things in the, in irons in the fire too, but, uh, um, check our website to see what's happening when you get closer to summer and we'd love to have you over. Dave, you mentioned that John Bozeman was from Georgia mm -hmm. and he left there about 1862 when yeah. he came out. Eight, yeah, 1860. I, I missed by a couple of years, but 1860 to Colorado. So he had no involvement, no ties with the South during the Civil War. Did he leave anybody behind? He left behind a wife and two kids. He was a Southern sympathizer. And this is just for history nerds, but um, he, there's a whole thing about Nelson's story, the cattleman, and, and uh, who drove the first herd of Longhorns north along the Bozeman Trail to get to Montana. So that was his thing. But then he established an empire up there. He was a huge Northern uh, sympathizer and he didn't like Southern sympathizers. So there's this whole thing about what happened to John Bozeman. And, um, but yeah, he was a Southern sympathizer, but yeah. He made his one guiding trip with a wagon train in 64 and that was it. And then they had a celebration and named a town after him, Bozeman, Montana. and. Uh, and then he was, then he tried his hand at half a dozen different things, and then met his mysterious and unfortunate end. Other questions? If not, thank you, Dave, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. Um, please look around a little bit if you'd like. And we'll see you next Thursday night for our opening event for the Wyoming Navy. So come back for that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. Join us. That was an idea. Y'all just because we know about it.